Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. This is Unit 10, Understanding Human Interference in Plant Selection and Genetics. And basically what we'll be talking about in this unit is what we as a human population have done that has we thought was good to feed the world population and what we're finding out isn't very sustainable for the long-term future. And here's just an, uh, a picture of how our agriculture is. And here's some sheep that are out in the field uh, eating the grasses that are there. And next to it, you see a field they're separated from, which looks like an uh, old corn field. Here's a picture of cattle out on the range out in close to the mountains. So I'm sure it's out west somewhere um, grazing and eating the grasses that are there. Um, historically, we have manipulated the genetic makeup of crops and animals and we weren't happy with what we had so we did things like we're only going to use the best seeds that we have but we changed and keep trying to get better and better and better in terms of uh, what seeds and what animals we have we weren't happy with let's say dairy cows um, that if you had one that produced 20 pounds a week of milk as opposed to one that did 18, we would select the 20 pound per week one and we wouldn't use the animals that only produce the 18. <clears throat> um, and we're breeding um, with the most desirable livestock. In the beginning, when we did, when they started doing it, it wasn't based on genetics. In other words, it wasn't very scientific. What they did was if you had three calves born, they'd take the strongest ones. And this wasn't that many years ago that uh, they basically just, if the farmer would look, and if it, you look like you had a weak calf, they'd send it to market or they'd kill it, one or the other, and they would not use it. They only used the strongest. Um, but gradually, they started getting more scientific, and scientists started using genetics to breed plants and animals uh, that became more of a science. In other words, they looked at different traits and what can we do to <clears throat> make sure to develop a method to change genes and that we only get the desired traits. You always had a variable variability in what you would get. All the calves wouldn't be strong and healthy and they found ways to get it better and better and better. Um, the field is changing tremendously uh, in plants and in animals and how we're getting better and better every year in terms of what we're able to create. Um, but from a sustainability perfect perspective, um, the number of seed types that we have has dwindled dangerously low. Um, basically, because we're only using the ones that our um, the, the best and going to produce the most crop, we don't have all the variety like we used to. Um, in animals, there used to be, and we'll get into some of the detail as we go on in the presentation, but basically the number of animals we've had because we want those perfect animals is down tremendously. Um, the genetic base currently that's being used is, is alarmingly narrow compared to some fields in terms of we only have what's the best. Uh, we gave an example um, in a prior unit talking about chickens that 90% of the eggs come from one type of chicken. It's not many types, it's 90% from one type because they're the best egg layers. Um, many of the crops in the process of this, we have the great traits where maybe they produce a bigger uh, kernel of corn on the cob so we get more corn, but they've lost the genetics that was the basis for pest and disease control that they naturally would have gotten being used because we're constantly changing them. They don't develop those disease resistances. In fact, they've lost the ability to um, manage that. Uh, unable to withstand those uh, adverse environmental conditions because they aren't there long enough and able to develop naturally those resistances to that stuff, we have to use chemicals to, in order to control those different conditions. When we have that, they're not uh, able to with, withstand things like a drought perhaps or an invasion of a certain insect and you have more crop failures today than you did in the past because of that, because that diversity isn't there. Uh, for the future, what we need to worry about 
is we need to look for that genetic diversity. Um, how can nature accomplish it by itself is a very good thing. We'll talk about natural selection and how that all works in a, in a few slides ahead and explain what the, the purpose of that or the theory of that. Um, and then explain how we process the genetic changes for what we use as humans and how we can make it so that it uh, works in a sustainable fashion uh, and not in an unsustainable one that we've developed in the last 40 years. And then what does the future of agriculture need as we're looking through that? So we're first going to look at our natural resources, um, the genetic changes that we have um, in nature that we're going to take a look at. Um, we need to create that natural diversity in the ecosystems. Um, if we do that, new species will appear by themselves, and then some of the old ones will become extinct. In other words, the new ones will take over, survival of the fittest that we've all heard about. And then in environmental changes that we've had in nature, we've had ice ages that have changed stuff. Everything's wiped out when the ice age comes and there's nothing that lives and then everything starts growing again once the ice age moves away. So we've had that. We've had land masses move. Uh, at one time, the seven continents were all together and they slipped apart over time. Um, and we're now the seven continents that we have. Um, mountains emerge and, and erode away, and that has to do with the plates underneath, the tectonic plates underneath the earth. We have the earthquakes that will change that, and that's how the mountain ranges have occurred. Um, and that'll change over time. And you're talking millions of years. You're not talking about 10 years type thing. Um, even though we have earthquakes on a regular basis where these plates are pushing up against each other. Um, and then all living organisms will adapt to these changes, or if they don't adapt, they're not going to make it and they'll die out. Um, natural selection. Uh, we talked earlier, we'll get to it, and this is basically, um, it, the definition is, is the gradual natural process by which biological traits become either more or less common in a population as a function of the effect of inherited traits on the different reproductive successes of organisms. And that's all occurring naturally. Um, and they're, it's happening by them interacting in their environment. It's a key mechanism of evolution. In other words, the change in the ecology happens naturally. And if we didn't have that change, that you wouldn't have uh, what we have today. Uh, the term natural selection was popularized by Charles Darwin, very controversial when he was talking about it, um, but he intended it to be used to be compared with artificial selection, which wasn't natural, but we currently call it selective breeding, and that's what the genetics were, were changing the, um, the ways in which we are breeding. We aren't letting it happen naturally, we weren't happy with it, we need to feed the world, that's what we're going to change it to. Um, adaptation. Um, it's that adaptation is how we use it, or the basis for which we use to understand how that natural selection happens. Uh, it's an aspect of all living organism, and they will adapt just like humans evolve. Um, we're part of Homo sapiens, and we've changed over the years. We all remember from biology where we went through and looked at when we were. We evolved from apes. That's an example of adaptation. Uh, it helps organisms utilize resources more meaningfully. Uh, different areas have different types of resources, and in order to survive, the organisms learn to adapt to use what they have in that area, and, and that's been proven uh, in areas where they were isolated, one thing was isolated from another, and the organisms looked tremendously different in one, one environment than another based on what was available resource-wise for them to use. Um, production services from stress and pressures of the environment is something out in the open. Is there some other uh, organism there that might help them uh, survive that'll get rid of some of the other predators that could be there? Um, assistance in reproduction, and then there's changes in local environments that are going to benefit organisms. That's why some organisms you'll see in, uh, you'll see grasshoppers in some areas and not so much in others, and it's because they have the environment that benefits that, and 
the animals aren't and organisms aren't going to stay around. They're going to move around to where they have a better chance of living. Um, genetic variation. This is what helps in that natural selection and the changes that happen. No two organisms are identical to one another. Just like humans, we're all different. No two one of us are the same. Um, this change or variation uh, happens in two levels. The genotype, which are the genes of the organism, and then the phenotype, which is the physical and behavioral expression of that genotype. In other words, how can they adapt to that? Examples of um, variations that we see in, in normal everyday life is the number of leaves on a tree. It's not the same in every uh, tree. They're all different. Even if you had the same variety tree, tree, two oaks, let's say, they wouldn't have the same number of trees even if you planted them at the same time. The size of the body parts. Um, this is talking about animals where it's tails, ears, legs, and hoofs. It could also apply to that example of the leaves and that the size of each leaf isn't going to be the same. Every leaf on the tree is not going to be the same size and shape. Also, within the different expressions of these characteristics, the var variations tend to average out. In other words, when you have the differing leaves, they are generally within a certain range that they are, two to three inches long, that type of thing. Um, you know, some will have tails, some won't. Some will have legs longer than others. Those types of, of variation can occur. But if you look at the average, it kind of gets to the, where they're all about within a certain range. Um, species variations can be uh, small or large in size. It tends to be the larger the number of a species, the more variation you're going to have. Um, what changes that? Well, it's going to be the variance attributed to um, how DNA replicates. And it doesn't always replicate perfectly. Um, and there can also be mutations, and it's just like in humans, that sometimes you have babies that are born that are deformed, that are missing body parts, those types of things. That's what that's talking about there. Um, some of the successful variations that they've been able to breed into plants uh, have been resistance to frost, or they can do an increased fruit size. Uh, fruit size would imply uh, things like apples, oranges, those types of things. It could also be cobs of corn, that you have larger cobs of corn over time. Um, some organisms will have uh, more favorable traits than others. As example, some will grow faster than other varieties. Some will be able to create uh, multiple crops during a season, like you'll keep flowering and getting more pumpkins or peppers, those types of things. And some plants or some varieties will be better at it than others. And then um, some will be more prevalent. They'll, in other words, they can repro reproduce on their own, and there'll be larger numbers because of that. If you have the ability to reproduce, you have more of an ability to have more uh, of your particular variety. If the environment didn't change, natural selection wouldn't exist. So things like physical bar barriers that allow for isolated changes to populations because that environment didn't change, that's why that would occur. Um, different populations will evolve differently based on their ecotypes, and eventually they would become a new species if they weren't around the other one because of the environment they're in. They keep adapting, adapting, adapting if there's a difference in what that um, area is like. Um, and based upon that, you're going to get some things that traits that they have that they'll lose, and then some that they'll gain. Some they'll use, lose, some they'll gain. And it's a constant change that's always occurring uh, all the time. Um, since we've started using GMO, genetically modified organisms, and we've reduced the number of habitats, guess what? That natural ecosystem is going away because the diversity went down, so therefore there isn't as much out there that's different that's going to allow those organisms aren't the same. They're all getting closer to the same because we're doing GMO because we control it more with specific traits that we're losing that diversity in the natural ecosystem. <coughs> um, domestication. Um, that has to do, in, in this case, we're going to talk about um, 
when we, for agriculture practices in humans, it's due to all the alterations in the genetic traits. In other words, can you survive in the environment you're in? What we've uh, become is that humans have to be there for these animals to survive. Um, and we're going to be dependent on these certain plants and animals, otherwise you can't be around. When you have that environment, what basically happens is it's called obligate mutualism. You need each other in order to survive. So we couldn't survive <clears throat> if we didn't have the current practices we have going on. If we look at some of the different traits in crops, um, we have larger fruits, but they have less structure to them. Um, we needed certain environmental conditions in order for a crop to grow. You need a certain amount of moisture, a minimum amount. You need a certain amount of sun. If you don't, it's not going to grow to that larger fruit. Um, the temperature has to be within a certain range or the plant will not grow. And then there has to be the appropriate nutrients in the ground. How we've gotten, what we've gotten to basically is that all of the nutrients are um, added artificially. Um, we're, synthetic, we're adding synthetic products to the ground. We don't have the right amount in there. If we look at for selected traits on livestock, we're controlling the environment they're in. So we did that, or it was done, so that you can produce meat in a quicker fashion. Now, if you produce it quicker with better animals, you're going to uh, make more money, and that's what they did. They modified milking cows so you can produce more milk. They're producing way more than they ever did with fewer cows. <clears throat> it's the same with eggs. They're only used 90% of the eggs we have that we buy in the stores are being produced <clears throat> by one breed of chicken. And then um, they're also breeding them to be more docile or tame. In other words, they aren't the normal animal instincts that you'd have to possibly be mean. They're breeding them out of us so they don't have those issues. <clears throat> um, in crops, um, usually in order to be able to survive today, you need to have specific conditions in the environment. So the amount of irrigation that you have, um, a lot of crops are being, especially vegetable ones, you have to have irrigation based on where they're growing them because they're growing them more of the length of time. They aren't growing as many, let's say, in the Midwest because we don't have 12 months of warm. They're doing it like in Florida or California or out west somewhere where it's warmer more of the season. Um, in order to, to grow, they need the synthetic fertilizers and nutrients added uh, manually. It's not something that in the ground it's there and the plants can use it. And then because they have uh, breeded out the ability to fight different diseases and insects, that they have to put herbicides and pesticides on there, the herbicides to control the weeds and the pesticides to control all the different pests you have and disease and insects. Uh, for plants and livestock, this is um, we're coming to understand this had a negative effect on the environment. If you have a negative effect on the environment, we're starting to find out that it has negative effect on human health. Um, we certainly have degraded the soil resource. In other words, the biotics of the soil aren't as good as they were 50 years ago, let's say. Um, and then the ability of plants and livestock to withstand what the environment is, the changes in the environment, is really, really a lot lower than what it used to be. Um, we're finding that insects that are out there that we used to be able to control because we controlled them through pesticides and not other methods, um, they're becoming resistant to it. So we're having a bigger problem because they're tearing apart our crops that we have in certain areas. Um, also, because we put cattle in the big feed lots, we've had to give them horm hor hormones and antibiotics, the hormones to make them grow how we want them to faster. And then the antibiotics, because they're closer together, they're, the sicknesses they could get are more. Um, because you're doing all those things, they're becoming immune to it. In other words, it's not working like it used to, just like medicines do in humans. Um, we're also finding that the herbicides that we use, uh, that weeds are becoming immune to those herbicides. In other words, they aren't killed by putting herbicides on uh, the ground. And we're also finding we're getting Roundup Ready um, crops. We're finding that they're 
where new generations of weeds are coming out, they're calling super weeds that are growing faster and bigger than they used to in the past and something like Roundup that supposedly kills all the weeds isn't going to work anymore. Here's a, a picture of a field that has GMO wheat and if you look at it, it looks just like normal wheat here. The thing is you can't tell just by looking at it whether it's GMO or not and what we're finding out is that some of the GMO qualities are being um, passed on through the animals to humans and they're trying to do studies right now as to whether or not that has a positive or negative effect. Uh, in fact, there's a huge discussion right now going on on whether labeling should include the fact that you used a GMO product in the creation of whatever it is you bought. Um, some of the pitfalls of doing selected, using selected traits or, or creating animals that had uh, just selected traits, the ones you wanted. Um, when we did that, you started to need antibiotics. You needed hormones to grow faster. It's a very controlled condition, and they have to have highly processed feeds in order to grow fast to use those uh, antibiotics and hormones to grow like we want and stay healthy. <clears throat> um, Directed selection in plants. The um, way we do it now is it's mass selection. Um, some of the different ones we'll get into the discussion on are mass selection, and that's where you're picking just certain ones that uh, uh, a whole huge group that will work well. Pure line selection where you keep growing and growing and growing something until you get just the best. Um, and then you end up with a production of uh, purely synthetic varieties. And then you end up with a bunch of um, different hybrids out there and, and nothing that's a uh, open pollinated. <clears throat> um, under mass selection, um, you use the seed from prior crops that have the best qualities you're looking for. So in other words, if the seed that you get, if it's on a bad plant, you wouldn't take that seed. What you're looking for is a higher yield because that grew better there's a chance it's more resistant to diseases if, if you had it. Um, uh, it's a land race plant in other words it was something that was grown in your area so it had adapted through natural selection to the local conditions um, and that's about the closest we can get to natural selection. Um, because you use seed from the prior crop in this mass selection method of planting and growing crops, it's going to be the closest um, to being able to keep adapting if those conditions will happen. And then you'll get genetic variability um, because you're not getting a, a hybrid out there that would possibly not have it because it's a hybrid for a huge area, not just your specific area. Uh, pure line selection, uh, you're choosing a specific plant after you've done a lot of testing, like I mentioned in the last slide. Um, you do many, many generations. In other words, you have to see that superior quality and keep getting it and getting it and getting it on each new generation. It takes a long time to create something like this uh, because only the best quality plants are going to prevail in that new variety. The whole idea of that is you're going to get little change to the genetics over time because you're only taking those ones with they exhibit the quality that you like. <coughs> um, <coughs> you artificially pollinate. In other words, you don't let <coughs> cross pollination to occur naturally. You do it yourself to force only the plants you want to get your desired traits. Um, very expensive crop when you get uh, seed when you buy that because it's a pure it takes longer to create it years and years um, production of synthetic qualities you limit the parent plants only to superior plants um, the variability is less than mass selected and open pollinated varieties in other words it's not going to be what's in that area you're going to pick specifically based on what genes you use to create that and based upon that you're not going to have as much variability. And then the last one is hybridization and that's um, 
today that's the primary method that's used. We're going to get into a little bit later in one, the next unit talking about um, some of the effects of doing this, but basically uh, most plants, that, well, most seeds that we plant today are hybrids. They are not open pollinated type plants. Um, it's a cross between two different varieties. That's how you get the best qualities. That's how you get the genes to go from one to another. <clears throat> and then if you have two purebred varieties that are planted, um, for example, corn uses the pollen from the parent plant and the seed from the producing line. So in other words, the pollen from the parent plant is going to go over to the, the line that has the quality you want. Um, what they do is they remove the tassels and detasseling a cornfield has happened for forever, but it's basically how you get two different ones to cross pollinate. Um, and you, because you're removing the tassels, the male flowers, you don't have that that um, pollen going from the male to the male, so it comes from that other plant. So that's how you get the qualities that you want in, in corn. Um, hybridization um, in sorghum, uh, it's introduced. You introduce male sterility, in other words, you create something that's sterile. Um, and it's used as a way to produce the parent. Uh, and it's just because sorghum, uh, how it works, it needs to be done this way in order to create a hybrid variety. Uh, it usually produces offspring that's very different from the parent plant. In other words, it's not true to the type, so it might not be suitable for planting. Uh, new seeds would be um, created every year. So you get, one of the things in hybridization is that that's different than from open pollinated is you need to get new seeds. Uh, most farmers, uh, like I said, because you're using cross pollinated uh, versions, you have to do it and have to buy new seed every year. If you took what was there, if you took corn from the uh, cobs from the field and tried to plant it, you would not get the same type of plant. Uh, in, induced polyploidy. Um, it allows for the perpetual uh, use of pure line crops, and the pure line crops were the ones that you create by different generations. You keep one more, one more, one more using just the best plants, and then you're going to get less of a chance of ever getting bad ones. Eventually, you're going to get all good ones. Um, they, you can use, in this one, they use a chemical stimulate to create new polyploids, and the polyploids are the genes within it. Um, what do they use this for? Basically, they can do it with wheat, corn, coffee, and cotton. And uh, this is getting down to the gene level. This is a controversial area that they're taking the genes from one and putting it into the other when they're creating it. And this is what people are getting really afraid of. Is it OK or isn't it? Um, you have transgenic modification. Uh, and this is an example of a uh, cow that was uh, basically transgenic modification is is that it is a cow that's not uh, there's not insemination it's artificial insemination with to create this cow and you did not use the bull but basically it's taking just those genes you want to create a brand new animal uh, real 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 controversial um, because you take that single gene from one organism to a completely unrelated one. Um, one of the other examples of transgenic modification that's going on right now is there's a place out east, I believe it's in Philadelphia, that's trying to create uh, tilapia that grows in less time than the others. And they're taking a gene from a completely different um, animal and putting it in the fish. And what's what they're saying is, does it, because it's growing faster, is it changing the makeup of the fish and is it safe to eat? Um, that's something that totally hasn't been answered. The fish seem to be fine, they seem to grow. Um, but basically, the reason they're doing it is to grow more fish quicker. They're going to feed more people, but they got to make sure it's safe. So that's what they're looking at because what you're creating is something different or custom with different traits than what it was originally. Um, so. Some people like it, some people don't, but we'll find out. And here are the attributions.
the pictures we had.